Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Hugh McKay, President of the Board of Directors of the City Club. On July 22, 1796, when Moses Cleveland landed at the mouth of the Cuyahoga, he envisioned this location as ideal for a prosperous port, and that was largely why he chose this place to be capital of the Western Reserve, though he probably did not envision a billion dollars in imports and exports here. So the Port of Cleveland is why we are not sitting at the Conneaut City Club or rooting for the Ashtabula Browns. In the 20th century, Cleveland became known as the best location in the nation, with our port playing a large role in making Cleveland a hub of commerce in the Midwest. In recent decades, the Port of Cleveland has experienced some wins, some losses, but with the arrival of today's speaker in town, there's been a surge of progress. William D. Friedman became president and CEO of the Cleveland Cuyahoga County Port Authority in June of 2010. Since then, the port has aggressively pursued growth in its core maritime business and made plans for an expanded role for the Port Authority aimed at job creation and increased economic vitality for Cleveland and Cuyahoga County. Under Mr. Friedman, the port initiated its first major capital investment on the lakefront in eight years with plans to build an on-deck rail yard, reviving talks for a cross-lake ferry to Port Stanley, Ontario, providing financing for a range of major construction projects, including the $275 million Flats East Bank project, opening an 88-acre nature preserve on Lake Erie, reducing operating expenses by 25%. And the port has proposed taking on a new role as steward of the Lower Cuyahoga, R Cuyahoga River to lead many critical infrastructure and restorative initiatives. Mr. Friedman has more than 25 years experience in port management, real estate development, the international supply chain, and multimodal distribution. He served as vice president of ports and logistics for Duke Realty Corp from 2004 to 2009. As CEO of the Ports of Indiana from 2000 to 2004, Mr. Friedman increased net income, cargo volumes, and private investments, resulting in a record $1.5 billion annual impact on Indiana's economy. Prior to that, Mr. Friedman served 10 years with the Port of Seattle in a variety of management roles, including Director of Seaport Strategic Planning. He currently serves on the board of the American Association of Port Authorities, and the Northeast Ohio Development Fund. Mr. Friedman holds two degrees from Indiana University, a bachelor's degree in history and a master's degree in public administration with a concentration in urban and regional planning. With our port in what he calls a, quote, recovery mode, unquote, Mr. Friedman is very upbeat about what he calls the tremendous potential of the port of Cleveland. Please welcome to the City Club, William Friedman. Thank you, you. It is truly a privilege and an honor to speak at the City Club. <clears throat> and I am delighted to be here in the same week this venerable forum launched its 100th anniversary celebration. This is a remarkable milestone and a tribute to the value of both civic and civil dialogue. I also want to recognize the Port Authority board members here with us today, uh, our chair, Bob Smith, uh, our Vice Chair Mark Krantz, and Director Steve Williams. Thank you for your steadfast support you've shown me since my arrival 16 months ago, and for your commitment to our new strategic direction. Also here today are nearly all the members of the port staff, and I want to make them stand up here for, for a moment, <clears throat> if you don't mind. As you can see, As you can see, it's, it was pretty easy for me to invite the entire staff here because um, they barely fill up two tables. Uh, I'm really proud that uh, we are able to accomplish what we do with only 18 full-time full employees. The strategic plan the board adopted last month sets out a new vision, mission, and, a, and 25 specific actions to impl implement our new mindset at the port. We are determined to be ambitious and realistic, entrepreneurial 
and financially disciplined, customer focused and collaborative. Our work will be grounded in data driven analysis, market realities and public priorities. And we will strengthen the public trust in the port with results, integrity and transparency. Our mission, quite simply, is to foster job creation and economic vitality. To do this, we will develop more opportunities for waterborne trade and business expansion. And we will lead critical infrastructure and environmental projects along our waterfronts, creating not only smart solutions to our pressing problems, but a legacy of new and improved assets. <clears throat> I'm excited by the path we're forging in strong collaboration with City of Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, state and federal officials, and many key stakeholders in our business and civic community. But before describing the plan in more detail, I want to relate my first visit to Cleveland. Uh, this was 2002. Uh, I was in my role then as CEO of uh, the statewide ports of Indiana. And quite frankly, I was envious of Ohio ports and Cleveland port in particular. Under Ohio law, port authorities can issue bonds to finance a wide range of construction and expansion projects. This was a valuable economic tool then, and it remains one today. At the time, Indiana had nothing like it, but we wanted it. So I, or I organized a delegation of state legislators, bankers, lawyers, and others to visit Cleveland to learn about port financing firsthand. We took a tour that showcased the port's development finance program from Applied Industrial Technologies headquarters on Euclid to an expansion at Parma Community General Hospital. And uh, of course, we heard the story of the port's start in the finance business in 1993 when it stepped in to help the organizers of the new Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum who were looking for a way to finance the construction. Fast forward 18 years, the Rock Hall brought added cachet and millions of tourists to this city. The Port Authority went on to help dozens of companies, nonprofits, and local governments secure $1.8 billion for other projects that have literally changed the landscape of our region. And in Indiana, with the support of the group that visited Cleveland, we enacted a port finance provision almost identical to Ohio's. I, I tell you this story for two reasons. First, as a newcomer, I'm keenly aware that some Clevelanders still have a lingering sense of civic inferiority. But as the outsider who came here looking for good ideas 10 years ago, <clears throat> and now as a transplant turned booster, I'm really impressed with this region. Second, I truly believe that our Port Authority can be a more powerful catalyst for revitalized and sustainable greater Cleveland. That's why I wanted this job, and that's why I'm here. <laughs> Over the last 16 months, I've had the pleasure of meeting a lot of people from a lot of communities. Not infrequently, I meet people who work in downtown high-rise office towers. A number of these people have remarked that they look down on the port. <clears throat> I, you know, I'd like to think they're making a spatial reference. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> but I can't help but suspect <clears throat> there's more than a hint <clears throat> excuse me, of critical judgment in, that, in there as well. Plenty of people really don't understand what the Port Authority does and don't believe our docks are busy enough. Clearly, we have work to do to make our maritime story both clear and real. And we are working aggressively to bring more cargo activity to the waterfront. But the role of maritime in our economy should not be overlooked. Nearly 18,000 jobs and more than a billion in paychecks cashed annually are tied to the cargo handled at public and private docks along the downtown lakefront and the navigational channel of the Cuyahoga River. Without question, maritime is still a major component of the local economy and central to the arc of this region's history. Cleveland took root along the waterfront, and today we occupy a prime location. 
We are the natural gateway in and out of the North American heartland for cargo transported by ship through the St. Lawrence Seaway. Waterborne transportation is the most co cost effective means of moving freight, has a lower carbon footprint than truck and rail, and it has vast untapped capacity. Unfortunately, U.S. policymakers don't get this yet as they do in Europe, in Asia, and in other places around the world. Um, where waterborne transportation, frankly, waterborne transportation uh, is not on a level playing field yet in uh, our country. Cargos traditionally shipped through Cleveland include the iron ore that feeds the blast furnaces at the ArcelorMittal steel complex, specialized steel from Europe, cement from Canada, salt mined from under the lake, and huge shipments of, ma of machinery that can weigh as much as a thousand cars and are destined for overseas customers. Who doesn't love the massive scale of these cargos and the ships? and the backstories to these international journeys. That's one reason I've always been drawn to this work. I also thrive on the opportunity to operate within and between the worlds of business and government. Port authorities embody this duality. They are entrepreneurial business enterprises that must compete for business with ports and other modes of transportation. And they are independent government agencies that make public investments with limited financial payback, but high benefit to the community. I came to Cleveland with 25 years of experience in the public and private sectors at both coastal and inland ports and working on economic development tied to the global supply chain. I started my career working for the city of Indianapolis, reviewing site plans and enforcing zoning codes. I was very fortunate to spend a decade at the Port of Seattle directing seaport planning and managing a portfolio of cargo docks and industrial properties. Like our port, Seattle's is located in the heart of the city. My experience in Seattle, where land use competition is acute, taught me that it is possible to weave a working port and other uses into a functional and vibrant urban fabric. As CEO of the Ports of Indiana, I took over an organization in need of an overhaul and sharpened business planning. The changes we made there resulted in higher net income, cargo volumes, and private investments. And at Duke Realty Corporation, I served as Vice President of Ports and Logistics, helping expand the company's supply chain, real estate business, to port markets and inland intermodal hubs, including the Rickenbacker Global Logistics Park south of Columbus. When I interviewed for this job, I, I told members, told board members that I, I was a planner by training and at heart, and that if I was hired here, I would immediately undertake a planning process to comprehensively analyze where this port is today and where it should go. I've been here long enough to know that people around here are weary of plans that wind up in the dustbin of planning history. I recognize that the architects of many of these plans wanted the best for this community. Like them, I can't guarantee your results. What I can promise is that we are, while we are passionate in our aims, we are dispassionate in our analysis. We will only embark on projects that we deem doable, that reflect public priorities, and will earn a sufficient return on investment to the port and the community. The new plan will guide our established maritime and development finance businesses and lays out a new role for the port as a steward of the ship channel and an 88-acre nature preserve on the lakefront created from sediment dredged from the river. We have also adopted clear and disciplined operating principles. We will manage our business operations for financial self-sufficiency so that levy dollars can be targeted for selective investments in public infrastructure. And in all things we do, we will be transparent, accountable, and sustainable. Earlier I touched on our development finance work. We recognize that despite an 18-year track record in this business, the port's role in helping critical development projects happen isn't widely known or understood. Many do not realize that nearly all the dollars in this program come from the capital markets, 
not the port's reserves, and have resulted in the expansion of dozens of valued companies and organizations, employed thousands of construction workers across the region, and resulted in hundreds of millions of dollars flowing to minority and female contractors. <clears throat> we know big developers are very familiar with this program, but smaller companies may not be. For that reason, we are soon going to start proactively contacting businesses across Cleveland and the county to introduce them to our financing capabilities. So now let me turn to everybody's favorite topic, the lakefront. We have put forth aggressive plans to grow our cargo handling business, to create jobs, and to give more companies in the region a competitive edge. We know maritime business development won't be easy. We readily acknowledge the difficult landscape we face. Our traditional cargo markets have been flat or declining for years. The St. Lawrence Seaway's size and winter closure are competitive disadvantages. And tidewater ports and big railroads still view the Great Lakes not as our fourth coast, but as a threat. But other market forces are shifting our way that could tip the balance and usher in a new, more diversified and active era for Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway shipping. Peak oil will keep fuel costs high, favoring water transport over land modes. Supply chain patterns are being adjusted to reduce carbon emissions, also favoring waterborne transportation. U.S. exports and manufacturing are on the rise, even leading us out of the recession. We are positioning to capitalize on these trends by moving forward on a number of fronts. Next year, we will build an on-dock rail yard, allowing us to compete for a segment of the market we just can't serve effectively today. We are actively pursuing a range of new maritime business opportunities, including a Cleveland-Montreal container feeder service, a cross Lake ferry to Ontario, a bigger role in handling oversized freight, including wind energy components, and we are making our port more competitive by reducing costs and improving service. As all of you know, before I arrived, the port launched an initiative to relocate to East 55th Street. The relocation plan captured the imaginations of many who want a more vibrant uh, waterfront. I completely get that. But it proved infeasible chiefly because it required an enormous public subsidy that just could not be funded. I strongly believe that our new plan embodies the right approach. Make smarter use of our existing footprint, which we are reducing, leaving ample space for mixed-use development on city-owned land immediately east of the port. I believe there's space in that location for at least a decade of development north of Brown Stadium east to Burke Airport where offices, housing, restaurants, retail shops, a hotel, marinas, and public space could be shaped to create a place that is authentically Cleveland and a lure for people and companies. In fact, that type of place is being built right now at the Flats East Bank project just south of the port along the river. Not only is this project our neighbor, but the Port Authority issued nearly half of the $275 million in debt to finance the first phase of that development, which will include an office tower, hotel, plaza, and restaurants, and ultimately new waterfront housing. This project and its location exemplify urban vitality at its best. I also believe we can make our port operations along the waterfront not just more active, but more visually appealing, more accessible, and engaging an engaging part of our waterfront. We've been brainstorming some of these ideas that include public art, green space, and greater accessibility. These ideas are purely conceptual, but, but here's a few we think are worth further investigation. Consider the two cement silos on port property. I'm sure you all have seen them. At the mouth of the river that stand about 100 feet high. Imagine if we use their height as an opportunity for public art. Maybe we tether giant canvases or banners to them created by artists from Cleveland or elsewhere. This could be a terrific merging of art and industry and an attraction that would be uniquely Cleveland. 
We also think landscape architects could bring more greenery to the port and viewing platforms where people can watch port operations and harbor activity. These ideas reflect our new way of thinking. How can we create or enhance assets to maximize benefits for the community? This is the thread that connects our work, whether it's growing our maritime business, providing more financing for development projects, or becoming steward of the river. I have to admit that even before I took the job, I was asking myself why the port had no role on the navigable portion of the river. To be honest, I just didn't get it. To me, the lakefront and the river are a system that need cohesive management. Our plan embraces this perspective and calls for the port to take the lead in solving for a set of connected and critical problems that have vexed us for many years. First, what do we do with sediment dredged from the river to maintain the shipping channel? Each year, enough sediment is scooped out to fill a sports stadium and then disposed of as waste in what are essentially landfills along the waterfront. Our goal is to change this paradigm so that the sediment is used beneficially in a variety of ways that can include roadway construction projects, brownfield remediation, landfill cover, and even creation of new aquatic habitat area or beach nourishment. This approach could save the region millions, can drive re revitalization of sites, and can serve as a model nationwide. Second, we plan to tackle the pressing problem of bulkheads that form the ship channel. Bulkheads do not exist or are in poor condition along 29,000 feet of the navigation channel. Replacing or repairing them is not only required for shipping, it's a precursor to development along the river and is necessary to reduce pollution runoff, control flooding in the flats, and safeguard the adjacent businesses. Again, we see more than a need to fix these assets. We see a chance to spur development and attract investment. Third, we want to tackle other, another long-standing problem, uh, namely the Irish Town Bend or Franklin Hill hillside below Ohio City that is slowly but inexorably sliding into the river. I didn't really get this until I walked out there my first, mo first month or so here past the barricades that have closed off Riverbed Road, and I saw how the road had split and had dropped about six feet down the hillside. Again, I'm convinced we can trans transform this problem into an asset. Stabilizing this 16-acre hillside will enable public access to the riverfront and construction of a stretch of the proposed Lake Link Trail connecting the towpath all the way to Windy Park on the lakefront. The fourth priority for our river is cleanup and restoration. Working closely with the Cuyahoga River Remedial Action Plan, we recently won a $425,000 grant from US EPA, US Environmental Protection Agency, to build a specialized vessel system to capture floating debris that will go into operation next summer. Each of these challenges is an impairment that keeps the Cuyahoga River from being declared fully restored by its federal regulators. If we can address these issues in combination with the regional sewer district's long-term stormwater management actions, it should allow for removal of the Cuyahoga from the federal list of impaired rivers. This will be a significant milestone for Cleveland and underscore how far we've come in the more than four decades since the infamous Burning River. I also need to highlight the Cleveland Lake Lakefront Nature Preserve, a one-time uh, dredge material disposal site uh, formerly called Dyke 14. This 88-acre peninsula, which is four times the size of Wendy Park, east of downtown Cleveland, provides one-of-a-kind access in an undeveloped setting on the lakeshore. Audubon, Ohio, has already designated the site as an important bird area, and more than 280 species of birds have been identified. In May, the port officially renamed, the Cleveland Lake, name, renamed it the Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve, and we will open it to the public on a regular basis in the near future. 
We're also working with key stakeholders to provide opportunity, educational opportunities at the site, especially school field trips, so children can experience the lakefront in nature in a new way. So now I've um, told you about the plan, and I hope you're thinking, well, this all sounds great. But you're probably also wondering, where do we get the money? Clearly, we will need to combine local, state, and federal funds in a creative way. And private beneficiaries should be asked to contribute as well. I believe that dedication of, dedicating a portion of the ports levy to river renewal is a natural fit with our mission and is the most sensible way to provide a local match needed to access public dollars from outside the region. The ports millage rate is by far the lowest in the county at 0 0.13 and has remained unchanged since the port's inception in 1968. It now generates about 3.2 million per year. That translates into county property owners paying about $3.40 annually for every 100 of assessed value. Another way to look at this, for someone who owns a $200,000 home, that's two lattes a year. Now that our plan has been adopted, we are working to refine cost estimates for the proposed infrastructure programs and evaluate financing, op financing options to minimize any burden on local taxpayers and maximize the federal and state contributions. Will the current levy be sufficient? We don't know yet. I do know that absent reliable funding sources, the Port Authority cannot carry out these projects, and our community puts the maritime sector and river restoration in doubt. There is, an, there is an imperative to get this work done, and we are eager to take up the challenge. Before I close, I'd like to tell you one more story. Last month, I began the year-long Leadership Cleveland program. Uh, for our first get-together, we were told to bring along an object of special significance. Uh, I didn't bring a picture of my wife, kids, dog, cats, fish, not because I don't love them. Uh, instead, I brought this. It's a bottle filled with dirt. But this is special dirt. This is sediment dredged from the river. This is really who I am. I'm a guy who wakes up in the middle of the night thinking about how can we put a stadium's worth of dirt dredged each year to good use. But that's okay because the way we take care of our communities is by moving the dirt and building the infrastructure and turning the aha moments into innovative results. I sense that this could be a great moment in Cleveland's history. I look around and I see a cadre of dedicated people working in the trenches from the neighborhoods to downtown and in this room, all toiling to help our community grow and prosper. I'm honored to be among you and I thank you for taking the time to be here today. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we're listening to a Friday forum featuring William Friedman, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Cleveland Cuyahoga County Port Authority. We will return to our speaker in a minute for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We encourage you to go ahead and formulate your questions now. Please remember to keep them brief. We remind you, members and guests alike are welcome to attend City Club forums, and we hope everyone listening will join the City Club. Please do join the club. We welcome all of you here and those listening to WCPN 90.3 FM, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations across the country. Our television broadcast partner is WVIZ PBS Ideastream. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. We're pleased to welcome guests at tables hosted by ArcelorMittal, Greater Cleveland Partnership, Jack Dover, John Carroll University, Port of Cleveland, Spiro Smith, and Tucker Ellis. Thank you for joining us today. 
We're also pleased to welcome students who are here as part of the City Club student program. Participation of these students is made possible by a generous grant from the Jeffrey David Epstein Memorial Student Fund. With us today are students from Max Hayes High School. Will the students please stand and be recognized? Now we would like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphones today, we have City Club 100th Anniversary Director Betsy Wallace and Program Director Carrie Miller. First question, please. Come on back. Mr. Friedman, the St. Lawrence Seaway is clearly important to our international maritime traffic. And I would appreciate your commenting a little further on both the political problems we face with East Coast ports and the physical problems that may exist in the facility itself. Sure. Um, well, I'll take the physical first, come back to the political. Um, I alluded in my speech to the fact that the seaway locks themselves were built, um, frankly, too small when the seaway was first built. Uh, the world fleet of ships has just grown larger and larger, and so what's happened is literally we can't get most of the ships out there plying the world's oceans into the St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, <clears throat> that has hurt us over the years, and it makes our economics in terms of the cost of moving goods somewhat unfavorable compared to ports where they can receive the largest ships. Uh, we also close the seaway system in the winter. Um, for maintenance, uh, and um, some in the industry have argued for years that it could effectively become a year-round system and eliminate the closure. Uh, that's up to the federal government, uh, both U.S. and Canadian, and we'll have to see. Um, I personally think we can overcome those limitations. I mentioned some of the factors, rise in fuel costs, uh, so there are some windows of opportunity open for us in terms of uh, being able to compete, and there's some it's a business that we have competed well for, uh, effectively for, for years that has never gone away, and we hope it never does. Uh, politically, yes, we, uh, if you go back and you study the history of the, uh, the deliberation by Congress uh, prior to the uh, decision to build the Seaway, uh, build the American portion of the Seaway, it's mostly a Canadian um, piece of infrastructure, um, you know, there was nothing... Uh, Nothing hidden about the politics. The East Coast ports and uh, the big railroads you know, did not like the fact that you could go by ship all the way to Duluth, Minnesota or Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, they saw that as a threat to uh, their business. And that, unfortunately, we, we still see that today. You don't, you don't hear it necessarily in testimony before Congress, but you know, people are, are capable of, of um, inserting their influence into these decisions um, outside of uh, the, the, the public domain. And uh, I think that's a narrow-minded view. Uh, not to digress too much, but I came across a speech by John Kennedy when he was just, a, I think, a freshman member of the U.S. Senate. And obviously, he's from Boston. And in that speech, he defended, and I think it was one of the first real policy positions he took um, as a New Englander, advocating for the establishment of the St. Lawrence Seaway. So there's always been enlightenment out there, and I think... Uh, we have an opportunity with our delegation today to make some progress. Uh, Mr. Friedman, there was a time, I believe about a decade ago, uh, long before you came to Cleveland as head of the Port Authority, when there were very serious thoughts about a ferry service between Cleveland and southern Ontario. Uh, what has happened to those talks? Okay. Would you be in favor of uh, some vigorous effort on our part to uh, restore them so there could be a, a meaningful uh, ferry service between Cleveland and Southern Ontario? Good. Thank you for that question, sir. Um, yes, um, there have been efforts over the years. And in fact, prior to um, or up until about the World War II period, there were ferries across the lake um, connecting Ontario and, and Ohio. Um, and we have um, renewed the discussions with one particular, actually with two communities on the Ontario side, uh, two counties, um, and those are moving ahead. So we are making some progress. Uh, we aren't yet to a point where we 
I could stand here and tell you that there will be a service that uh, starts next season or in some future season, but it is our goal. And um, I personally believe there is a market both on the both moving people and moving freight across the lake. Uh, really, all you have to do is look at a map, and it's pretty intuitive. Uh, tremendous trade volume between Ontario and Ohio, and lots of people who want to go back and forth. So why we don't have at least one ferry uh, making that crossing um, is is rather astounding. And it, it you know, the the reality is that we we sort of ceased being a maritime country some years ago. Where this used to be a country where we made a lot of ships, we had a very large merchant marine fleet, and we always thought about moving people and goods on the water. Uh, we've gotten away from that. And you know, myself and others in our industry, we are trying to uh, make our voice heard um, in uh, Washington, D.C. on that issue. And um, obviously, a lot of competition for airspace today, but you know, that we will look for help from uh, the federal government, potentially the state, and uh, uh, we're, we are working hard to try to get that service started. Hi. Uh, I'd right. like to ask another question as well. Uh, as far as the container service that you're looking at, if you could make more comments on that. You know, I know that in the 70s and 80s there, there were container services into the Great Lakes and then they were discontinued. Right. So I was just wondering if you could update us. Okay, I'll be glad to do that. Um, yeah, uh, you know, the, the, the subject of containers on the Great Lakes is fairly controversial, at least for those of us who make a living doing this. Um, and uh, as um, Dr. Hull uh, has just correctly stated, there were some services that started in the early days, very early days when ships were still small, and there was a fleet of container ships out there that could... Uh, uh, they were sort of right size for uh, the lakes and the seaway. Since then, as I mentioned, container ships have really gotten supersized, and um, there aren't many out there uh, that can serve that trade. Um, and therefore, we just have not had containers uh, moving on the Great Lakes uh, or coming in and out of this system. And I think we all know that almost everything in international trade today, if it can be fit into a container, that's how it moves. It's very, very efficient. It kind of enabled um, globalization. <clears throat> at, we are working hard, uh, talking with, at the moment, primarily one um, large uh, global container carrier and um, who has shown an interest, uh, an unsolicited interest in this service. And, you know, I've, I looked at these numbers closely. We've done our own analysis, um, and we think the numbers work. But it comes back to... Um, you know, how do you change uh, the mindset among um, the people who make the capital investments to get this service started? And you know, we, if we could get over that hurdle, I firmly believe that service would work and we'd see more and the floodgates or lock gates, uh, as it were, would be open and we would see uh, container shipping directly into um, to Cleveland. What we're talking about here, just for clarity, is a feeder service, which means big ships go across the Atlantic from, some, from Rotterdam or Bremen, Germany, or where ha what have you, a large port in Europe, <clears throat> go to Montreal, outside the, uh, just outside the entrance to the St. Lawrence Seaway, and then um, there's an exchange from a, smaller, from a larger ship to a smaller ship and vice versa, and then the smaller ship comes into um, our system. Those, that's commonplace around the world. You go to Asia, you go to Europe. You know, you go to a port like Hong Kong or Singapore or Rotterdam, and there are hundreds of feeder services and ships everywhere in those harbors. And uh, again, I, you know, I look out at our lake and I see vast empty water, and, and it just, you know, makes me want to cry that we don't have that sort of um, activity here. But we're, we're, we're pushing, uh, and we're, you know, unfortunately, um, we, don't, we don't make those decisions at those companies that uh, buy those ships. Hi, my name is Norris Mays. I'm a senior on the path of going into the Navy. I just wanted to know what advice would you give uh, high school students today to stay focused? Mm. Um, well, you've already made a decision, a big decision to go into the Navy, and, and I applaud that. Uh, and I'm sure that will uh, provide you with skills for the rest of your life um, that will serve you well. 
Um, I, I guess if I would give you advice, maybe it's the same sort of advice I give my kids, which is to you know, try to think hard about you know, what it is that you can do to try to serve your community. Um, you know, I think we get caught up in, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be a doctor, and all those sorts of things, but you know, maybe it's okay to do what you're doing, serve your country, maybe you go into the Peace Corps. Um, you know, I, I think it, it, right now um, we all need to think about, you know, what is it that we can do to apply our skills uh, in the service of our community. Sir, um, is there a category of product that offers the best growth opportunities in cargo, agriculture, natural gas, or something that you may not be doing right now? Sure. Um, well, in terms of sort of how the market segments itself, um, steel is our traditional um, commodity that moves into our port, and um, it, we'd, we'd like to do better in that market. We think we can. We think there's some opportunities to handle more steel in both directions. Um, I alluded to um, heavy, large pieces of machinery. We make a lot of that in Ohio, and exporting is up. We would like to be the point of export for those companies. Um, we um, aren't there yet. We've got to work harder. We've got to work again with the service providers on the water side to make that happen. But that's clearly a market we see with potential uh, to export more large machinery um, overseas, made here. Um, wind energy, um, if you go to other Great Lakes ports, go to the Port of Indiana on the Great Lakes, to Duluth, you will see wind energy components, blades, towers, turbines, everywhere on those ports. And we don't see that here, largely because we just haven't seen wind farm development in Ohio as you have further west. We hope that's coming to Ohio, Pennsylvania, maybe New York, and we'd be in a position to capture more of that business. It's very, very good business. Um, I mentioned containers, and you know everything goes in containers. So it could be Heineken from Holland coming in from Europe. Uh, or, uh, you know, kitchen goods made in Italy. Uh, and on the outbound side, it, you know, again, we produce a tremendous amount of um, high-end manufactured goods in this state. Uh, I think we are number three, if I'm not mistaken, in terms of exporting states. Um, so we know, we've talked to these companies, that if our port had a container service that was uh, cost competitive, competitive in terms of the frequency of the service and reliable, they would use it. So, um, the, and that would open up, uh, you know, to a, a very wide range. You mentioned ag, I'll just quickly um, uh, speak to that. Uh, yes, ag products are more and more being put in containers. Uh, the Port of Toledo has an export grain elevator. Um, and we don't have that here in, in Cleveland, but many other Great Lakes uh, ports do. Uh, and but what's happening is that you're seeing more and more grain, soybean, corn, wheat, getting stuffed into a container to be exported. So that, that could be a great, what we call backhaul cargo for us as well. We're really not that far from, from agriculture here um, in Cleveland. Mr. Friedman, there's a lot of concern about uh, the lands east of the river that the port has being potentially far more valuable for a higher or better use than the port, mm -hmm. at least in some people's view. In my own view, it would be nice if we, we even had a seat amenity uh, to have a marina downtown that would deal with transient and charter and resident dockage uh, like Chicago or many other places do. Are there flexibility or studies or plans within what the Port Authority is doing, having decided at least for now to stay in those docks to move the port or move portions of the port someplace else, whether it's west of the river or Burke Lakefront or whatever the, the other studies have shown might be possibilities? Sure. Um, well, as I said, um, we reviewed the earlier initiative to relocate the port to East 55th Street. In fact, we looked at um, a, a number of other sites that have been studied over the years as a uh, potential relocation for the port's docks, thereby opening up that space. And we concluded that Given the fact set and the circumstances today, that just doesn't appear to be feasible. And that the best course of action is for us to continue to operate the port where it is and reduce the size of the port, which we have done, 
or which we are in the process of doing and, and was um, a part of the plan that the board approved, opening up more space for development immediately to the east. Uh, and it's a lot of space. Uh, you know, it would be one matter if we had no space on our lakefront or in our core of our city for development. Frankly, we have lots of space. This is a city that has shrunk from close to a million people to a little, uh, little under 400,000, about 400,000 today. Um, and we have ample room for development. So the conclusion we've reached is let, let's not, you know, we can't have addition by subtraction. Why should we essentially put the port out of business in order to make room when we have ample room? So um, it, we have shown in our plan, uh, and the city is also um, working on another plan right now, that I think people will see and will respond to positively because it shows a huge footprint from north of the stadium over to Burke Airport for a much, much more enhanced lakefront. Um, now, over time, we will look at these the set of facts again. We will analyze the circumstances again, and we'll let the chips fall where they may. If there does come a point in time when it is good public policy for the port to shrink itself further or seek to relocate somewhere else um, or work collaboratively with a, another port, we would, we would certainly do that. Lake Erie is the shallowest of the lakes. Correct. Doesn't the very shallowness limit the size of the ships that can come in here? Uh, no, you're, you're correct. It is the shallowest of the Great Lakes, but um, the, the, the depth of the channels throughout the whole Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway system is 27 feet, um, and uh, the lake is deep enough so that that does not become a constraint. Uh, we've got plenty of constraints, but that fortunately is not one of them. been a, a conversation um, in the plane dealer about possibly, you, you talked a little bit about the relationship to the Flats East Bank project, but is there overlap in the plans that you've proposed, and is everybody happy with the way those two plans merge together? Well, there's no overlap. Um, at least, um, I don't see the overlap. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, as I said in, in my remarks, I think, and I've seen in Seattle and elsewhere, that the working port can coexist with other uses in the same vicinity. Uh, I think they can even reinforce one another, and what you end up with is a um, whole greater than the sum of the parts, where we have that real messy vitality that I, I think we all sort of viscerally respond to when we see it. We know it works when you're in Rome or you're you know, in Houston or wherever it may be. And so um, I also mentioned that even before uh, some comments were made about the potential for the port to do some harm to the Flats Project, uh, we are thinking about how do we make the port more inviting? How do we make it more green? How do we get people down to the port so they can see what's going on, which is of interest to people? And uh, again, you know, in, in Seattle, for those of you who've been there, um, lots of examples there and in many other harbors. Um, so no, I, I don't see the overlap. I think these, these uh, uses can function uh, side by side. Um, and we look forward to uh, continuing to make that project a success. Uh, yes, Mr. Friedman. The, uh, 10 or 12 years ago, I think there was a great expectation that we might have to begin importing certain uh, fuels, not oil, but uh, nat uh, liquefied natural gas and things of that nature. The developments in technology and horizontal drilling and the uh, identification of huge reserves in the state of Ohio has become a major, major uh, opportunity. And I know the governor's office and others have focused a lot of attention on it. And in those discussions, I've heard the opportunities occurring or expected to occur in the future for the exportation of liquefied natural gas and perhaps other fuels that come from this new drilling process. Is that something that the Port of Cleveland uh, would have a role in in your, in your view, or have you had a chance to explore you, that yet? You know, um, Mike, we haven't looked at that. We're just, we're just starting to um, look at the, the implications of um, 
extracting natural gas um, in our region. And, um, uh, you know, an LNG terminal, liquid, uh, um, I I'm sure uh, if the demand was there, uh, the marketplace would beat that demand somewhere in the vicinity. Um, we'd be at the forefront uh, without a doubt in terms of d making a determination whether that was an opportunity for us. But uh, to be honest with you, I, I couldn't tell you right now. Mr. Friedman, you have a wonderful national perspective on how ports are run. And uh, here's the classic easy question for you. Uh, what do you think of your boss uh, in the sense that Which you one? work? Well, <laughs> Well, actually, uh, you could decide which one you feel okay. most beholden to. <clears throat> but um, over the years, I think there has been some pretty vigorous discussion over whether the structure of the Port Authority uh, is uh, a wise one, given its, its current task. Um, and uh, if you uh, care to skate on that ice, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on it. Um, you know, I really don't have... Uh, a, a strong view on that on that question. I think you know the um, the makeup of our board today is is excellent. Um, they are extremely supportive of me and my management team. Um, I have heard um, had an opportunity to brief both the mayor and the county executive on our plans and. Um, that topic did not come up, so um, that would lead me to conclude that it is not on their agendas. Um, I know it has come up uh, historically. Um, I, I'm going to leave that to others. I think uh, the governance works, and um, we're just marching forward with our new agenda. Thank you for being here. The uh, Port of Indiana. Uh, encompasses facilities both on Lake Erie and on the Ohio River. Yeah. Uh, do you see there uh, that there's a need uh, for a similar set of policies here in Ohio to integrate uh, not just the uh, maritime facilities on uh, on Lake Erie and uh, uh, on the Ohio River, but uh, also with the uh, uh, the railroads and the uh, uh, highway facilities? Um, you know. Th um, that's even harder than the last question, I think. <laughs> the, the, uh, there are pros and cons with, with both um, Ohio's model, which is independent municipal ports, many of them. Uh, a lot of them just do financing. They aren't anywhere near navigable water. Um, and that was the same in Washington State, actually, um, versus Indiana, which has a central port authority. A, the board members are appointed by the governor, and, and it doesn't have any competition. Um, from locals. Um, I think competition can be good. I think we all agree that, that you, know, there, there's a, um, you know, there's an efficiency to competition. Um, I kind of believe that it, what matters is the leadership. What matters is who's running our ports, um, what sort of cooperation do we get from, from the state, uh, do they understand us. Uh, we're working hard with this administration, and, and as we would with any, to get them to understand the value of maritime. And I do that with Paul Toth, who's my counterpart at the Port of Toledo, and with the other ports from, port directors from throughout the state. Um, and, you know, we really, we don't overlap very much. We tend to serve sort of distinct markets, and, and I guess I'd say if it's, if it's not broke, let's, let's not try to fix it. Hi. Um, you're primarily a, a, a local institution. You've talked about the local government situation, but just in the last couple of days there have been some international uh, uh, policies or, or agreements passed that uh, relate to trade with foreign countries. Having said what you said about the St. Lawrence Seaway, can trade policies on the national level have a significant impact on our, on our local port business? Yes. Um, you're referring to the, uh, the NAFTA... Uh, there was among those trade deals, I think there was one that was perhaps a NAFTA, although I have to admit I, I, I didn't pay cl close attention to them. Um, I do see, you know, Canada, U.S., Mexico trade being in play for us in the future. We're, again, you look at a map, we're, we're positioned well. But, but again, we've got to get maritime, we've got to get waterborne transportation on a level playing field. We, we really... Um, 
tend to almost uh, unintentionally push freight onto the highways and push freight onto the railroads. And um, if we can get that playing field leveled, then I think you know, we can see some of that north-south, not just east-west flow um, through our port. Thank you. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we've been listening to William Friedman, President and CEO of the Cleveland Cuyahoga County Port Authority. Thank you, Mr. Friedman. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.